Welcome to the Off the Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. And I'm Dan. This is our podcast about anything and everything off-road. Tonight, we're going to be a little all over the place, but that's kind of normal. Uh, Ross is in the Northeast. I'm in the Midwest. And Dan's out in California. Um, and that's that's all I got for the open. So yeah, welcome, that's it. welcome back, Dan. Welcome back. <laughs> oh, thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Dan returns. Uh, <laughs> Ross, what in your list do you want to discuss there? I have very, very quick and brief things to discuss so currently there is a kia that is here it is a hybrid and it is actually very good we'll talk about that more after it leaves uh ev6 gt next week in california so that should be fun Mm -hmm. um despite the fact that i'll probably sit in traffic most of the time with it but you know that's uh as dan can attest rush hour california commuting life um that's good for your range yeah, it was like a perfect exactly. use case. Perfect <laughs> use of 560-something <laughs> electric horsepower. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I, I had the EV6 um, sometime last year, and it was excellent. I actually drove it, and by the time I got back to my house, uh, bringing my daughter to the pediatrician, I had more range than when I left, which, thank you, uh, you know, regenerative braking. So. Oh, okay. So the, the EV6 GT next week, I don't expect that because it is the fast one, allegedly. You'll then, never guess who just entered the waiting room. Huh. Can I guess? <laughs> no, you'll know who it is. I'll know. Well, it says yeah. Mike Levine, so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That is exactly how this show goes. That's normally how, how it yeah. goes. Yeah. But yeah, so. Hey, guys. Uh, Hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. <laughs> I could I could go through my evening, but uh, that would take us way off course, further off course than these trails. So I am uh, all I'm going to do is say that I am totally sorry uh, for uh, tuning in here late. It's been uh, one of those days. You're that completely is fine. We had just actually okay. started to record. <laughs> Did uh, was Dan able to join or no? Yeah, no, I'm Dan here. here. Okay, uh, amazing. Sorry, guys. <laughs> that is very very okay. On a show of tangents. This is uh, the ultimate tangent, the ultimate tangent. So thank you for joining. Um, Chris, I guess we're just going to roll through it, right? Just keep going. Yeah. Okay. Uh, So to to round out the local-ish press car discussion, uh, after I get back from California, the BMW X7 arrives for a semi-local road trip. And is that the one with the hideous front end? I mean, you could just say BMW, and I, I know I literally know nothing about BMWs. I was just making a fun joke. The it's not as bad as the Seven Series, the sedan, or the you know i Seven, but it's not pretty. Although I hear it's extremely comfortable. Um, and then after that, staying on the BMW theme, the Mini Countryman is what I have <laughs> following that up. So we'll talk about that after. Um, you know, the Countryman theoretically has some rally cred. It's run to car, at least in its prior iteration. You mean so, you mean the Countryman body has been placed on something else that then correct. ran to car? Yes. Okay. There was a frame on which a uh, body that looked <laughs> like a Mini was placed over much caging. and Dan's close enough works. <laughs> It's 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 marketing, it's branding. So yes, that's all I got. So my update this week is actually a little more uh, enlightening because I actually got an email that says stuff is shipped. So skids skids and sliders for the Sequoia are on the way. Um, hopefully in time for the rally uh, in the end of March, early April. Um, you know what shipping's like these days. Maybe, Where are maybe they shipping they here, maybe? from? Texas. March, April, and they're shipping from, now. I think you'll from get Texas. Okay, so from Texas to Kansas City, I think your bigger problem is going to be actually looking at them in, and the time between you get them, look at them, and install them. Yeah, that's probably the most. It, that's, it should, that's, they should that's be how here Saturday. Parts work. Right, they should be here Saturday. It should not be that big a deal. But there was one weird thing in the email. It was like one of six, and only one had a delivery date on it, and the other things were like, "We'll let you know." So. Not a hundred percent certain what's going on there. Um, and the only other update I have is I'm seeking a hitch mounted uh rear shackle. The Sequoia doesn't have a, a 
tow hook on the back of it. And so I'm going to go without replacing the entire rear bumper, since it is my wife's daily driver, we're just going to go with a hitch mount, uh, just throw a, a big, probably seven eighths shackle on the back of it and go from there. So I don't do a lot in the mud anyway. So. Well, it's going to be in the rocks, rocks and mud get you in the same issues, just a matter of how sticky it is. Yeah, there should be enough people sitting around with winches. We'll be okay. <laughs> Based on the prep uh, that I've seen for the rally, we should be just fine. Yeah. So Dan and Mike Defilio and Chris is, uh, well, actually, we as the podcast have been invited to be the official podcast of the Rogue Overland Rally in Utah, um, in Moab, the week prior to Easter Jeep Safari. And Chris yes. is going with the 2008 Sequoia uh, stock <laughs> height on uh, Toyo AC3s with a little bit of armor. So a little bit <laughs> rogue overland is the, the group that we're participating with. Oh, I have to look that up. Yep. They yeah. are interestingly primarily, at least the owner and operator is Nissan based. They, they That's are nice. very much Nissan guys. We, we were introduced to them uh, through Sean Holman. Oh, very cool. And where, uh, where are you guys, uh, where are you guys going to be in Moab? Do you know yet? You know, which trail um, you're Seven Mile, and the other one was um, Devil's Racetrack. Okay. So based based on the videos I've watched for both trails, I think I'll be okay. But there's a reason the armor's coming. Yeah. <laughs> Better say than sorry. Very much Thank so. Thank you, along with armor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and... So I wanted yeah, I was, to take, I was gonna say you never never regret when 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 it's needed, you don't regret having it. A hundred percent. And I, I used to have 100%. an 04 Wrangler years ago that those were the only mods I did was a fuel tank skid plate and a transfer case skid plate and the uh, steering box. That's all I did to it. And then I would beat it everywhere and loved it. It was it was fantastic because like, oh, what was that? Doesn't matter, just a skid plate. Like we're good, like keep yeah. moving on. The blanket statement of all blanket statements is that nobody who has ever gone off road has wished they had less protection. That is, that is a, uh, that's a, that's a, a, a words to live by right there. Yeah. yeah. As an off-road podcast, <laughs> the, the first thing we recommend is tires. And second thing we recommend is protection, armor, skids, sliders, you know, bumpers. So yeah. Anyways. <laughs> We'll revisit the uh, the mob trip and Chris's inevitable um, fender quarter panel damage on his wife's Don't, don't jinx it. <laughs> what are you doing? What are you? Uh, I, it's, it, it'll be fine. I'm sure that they'll get you through everything. It's oh, fun. you forgot to say the Midland radio that I'm going to install in it too. Yes. Yes. Finally. <laughs> About time. Um, Midland was kind enough to send us radios last year after we had them on the show. Uh, thank you for them. And um, I installed mine shortly thereafter, and Chris is still getting his. So, yeah, <laughs> it's it's still there. Hey, I look forward to hearing about that because that is uh, one piece of kit that I do not have. And um, I think that is a great alternative to remembering to bring the walkie talkies and then making <laughs> sure that they're charged and then making sure that the batteries are going to hold the charge. Like those are like three, three reasons to um, opt for radios. Mike. Yeah. The reason you'll like it even more is the <laughs> receiver, like Ross, what do you call it? The, the walkie talkie portion of it, yeah. with the cord, everything's yeah. in the hand, hand set. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not out on a trip, you literally just disconnect it from the radio base, which can be up under the dash or put away, or you can actually uh, have it as a, like a, like boards always have those aux switches that you just put a switch in mm -hmm. and you just plug in the handset when you're ready to go on a trip. Yeah, I look forward. I, I'd love to hear. Um, yeah, please keep us updated on the uh, on the Midlands because that, uh, like I said, that's definitely on the uh, Amazon slash uh, REI slash four by four parts uh, gift list. The well, spreadsheet quite extensive on your part, right, Mike? <laughs> well, you, you notice how I was covering all the bases there, right? Yes. So, yes. <laughs> well, we know a guy if you want to uh, if you want to get in contact with somebody. Invaluable communications comes like, I mean. There was a time on a... <laughs> you can never have too much protection and you can never have too much comms, okay? <laughs> exactly. There, there was a time off-roading on the ATVs. Well, correction. I was the only one on an ATV. Everybody else in my group is in a UTV. Um, Ten of us were spread out over seven miles in Maine. So 
that plus dust, I mean, comms are invaluable. That and also the you know little flashing strobe lights that you mount to the back of the machines because uh, you don't want to crash into somebody. <laughs> Anyways, um, crashing's always bad. Yeah, crashing is general oh, unless you're cool. yeah unless if you're you know running like one of Cletus's races down in Florida, then crashing's good. Yeah, that is a forerunner that picture is taken in. Yes, I recognize it. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. Very cool. It is. It's come a long way since the uh, the Cobra CVs of uh, you know, right? Yeah, just more 70s range through the nineties. Yeah, you you do have to get a GMRS license, Mike. Yep. I and and I now 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 this has got to be a whole episode. So how <laughs> difficult is it to get a GMRS license? You, like that seems like, like it'd be a multi choice. You, you fill out a test. form. You fill out a form and send the form in and pay. What is it? Seventy bucks. Uh, no, remember it's cheaper now. Oh yes, it, it, yeah. yeah. Wait a minute, right. is this it a is. ham radio? Then are we talking about? It's no, not. no, 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 no. But you still have to register with the F- FCC. Yes, so it's not F-A-I. a CB. We're talking about something in between ham and CB. Yeah, yes. So G G M R S. So the handheld walkie talkies that almost everybody has all the time are called F R S. Um, and so GMRS is like FRS radios on steroids. So those FRS radios have like a, maybe a two pipe, maybe you get lucky and get a three mile range mm-hmm. where the GMRS never, never right? No. Especially <laughs> like hills. mountain to the horizon with nothing between. Right. So the GMRS radios actually, can, you can get range numbers that I've seen 15 miles. Dan, I've seen Dan 20 has- miles. <laughs> And there's one that's these? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, those are the little FRS that, ones. The one to ones. Yeah. 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 So the GMRS ones take your range out to like 20 miles. My, oh, yeah. All my right. Own. So so this sounds though, it sounds easier than getting a drone license these days. A hundred percent it is. <laughs> Chris has <laughs> considering I got license. both. Yeah, 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 it definitely is. <laughs> and and the uh the unit that Midland sent me allegedly has a 50 mile range. I have yet to test anything further than about five ish. So is it hot rotted from the factory? I mean, a little, uh, no, that's, that's a, like a production. I haven't, I haven't touched. Wow. Yeah. So, and Mike, all right, Dan, I think we have something to focus on after this podcast. I'm actually, (laughs) if I go, if I go uh, dark for a couple of moments here, maybe because I'm scrolling through for, GMRS (laughs) GMRS <laughs> uh, receivers. Again, exactly. we have the contact. So let's uh, let's dive into it. So first question is, how did you guys meet and how did you decide that you would go on these <laughs> off-road and camping trips together? Mike, uh, let's see. I'll tell my version. He can tell his version. Uh, <laughs> I think he was working for pickuptrucks.com and I was at edmunds.com and uh, we just... I don't know if we met at, a, at an event or what, but there was a couple of times where we talked about, you know, pooling our resources to do a towing test. I remember that. And, you know, I think we all, Mike, where do you remember? Somewhere, something like that, right? No, that sounds, that sounds about right. That, that back in those days, it was like, oh yeah, let's pool our resources together. Cause we can do a whole lot more combined than <laughs> we can do alone because of the you do a test, you do a test, especially like a tow test or comparison test. And you're talking potentially big, big dollars to do that. Yeah. The logistics, especially when trailers are involved are just insane. The logistics yeah. when trailers are involved for a single person towing a single machine can be insane in of themselves. So yeah, get that. Yeah. But, but those, those early pickup trucks.com comparison tests kind of broke the mold you know for the sports car tests we always had you know the, the measurements the emotional and then like the how do you feel about it as a whole but for for trucks prior there was never anything that really broke it down the way pickup trucks.com did um and i know personally at least i i fascinated over that stuff so it's interesting to see the two of you with your collective technical uh, angles come together and and you know find each other in this weird world that we love. 
Yeah, I, I think uh, I think the trailer towing just kind of blew our minds through the uh, logistics, and it was just like, all right, let's just go camping in the dirt. Okay, that's a way to let, that's that's way easier <laughs> <laughs> dealing, dealing with goosenecks <laughs> and uh, and fifth wheels. Yeah, for sure. So uh, so how do you guys? I mean, for the listeners that may or may not know about this, but but Dan and Mike have a tendency to, I guess, find ways to go exploring together and make wherever it is that they are seem unbelievably picturesque and beautiful and, you know, also challenging for the off-roader. So I'm, as somebody who lives and, you know, off-roads in the Northeast and has limited places to do so, how do you guys pick where you're going to go what you're going to do, like where you're going to camp. That's, that's something from the opposite coast that is really <laughs> interesting. I'm just going to me. dive in because usually it begins, it, it may begin with a phone call of me like calling Dan like at yeah. three o'clock in the afternoon and saying, hey man, I think I'm going to get up like really early the next day and I'm going to go camping somewhere. You want to go? And without any regard whatsoever for what Dan's <laughs> life planning is about. The family. And, yeah. and just seeing if I can convince him to join me on, on, a, uh, on a trip somewhere. Yeah, Mike's the instigator usually, uh, and uh, he'll go if I can't. And <laughs> he'll go if I can't is a great phrase. Go by himself if I can't. But I know there was one where he called me, and it's like, "Hey, I got this place I want to go to. It's on the North Rim of the Grand Canyon." And and he he sent me a little uh, thing on Google Maps, a pin where it was, and I looked at it. It was like it's going to be like a 400 mile drive and he was going to leave the next day we were going to stay one night <laughs> and i and i and, and of course i'm a nut because i have a little hobby on the side called geocaching and i love oh, yes and there was a geocache like six miles from where we wanted to camp and it hadn't been found ever and it was like three years old it's like oh i'll go i mean you know i would have gone anyway but that just sealed the deal Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, Mike, we, uh, you have to let me stop here and pick this thing up on the way. But it was like 50 <laughs> feet off the trail we were going to use anyway. So it was no big deal. I have a very close friend who isn't into the off-road world, but it, he's into hiking and, and everything. And, and there's always a side quest to geocache. There's always a side quest. <laughs> yeah, no, I, we've, we've done countless hikes together and may or may not have done um, alleged drag races with his since departed mini and my since departed miata um but yeah geocache like there's always it's crazy how you think you're somewhere that nobody's ever been and then there's a geocache like, yeah, that's yeah i think Dan, dan's taken us to a couple of geocaches like there was this one by the grand canyon there was another one out out by the white mountains that we had to stop on the side of the road to, white uh, mountains to try to find new, the new hampshire white mountains no we, no no, the no, no. White there's, mountains there's are... all every state oh. every state has a white mountains range if ah. you didn't know that yet <laughs> yeah because I, I, um, it's like a spring field there <laughs> so uh yeah the white mountains are parallel to the sierra nevada one range to the east okay hmm. and so when you're there you can from those campgrounds look at the sierra nevada across the owens valley and it's quite picturesque this was the campground that we went to uh in uh oh man that's a heck of a video i don't think i've seen yeah, that, that before is... <laughs> that yeah that's campsite that's the literally sunrise. yeah that's the sunrise video yeah that it's... campsite was literally on the rim this is like a side canyon it's not grand canyon proper we're not quite in the national park we're in the national forest so you can do dry camping wherever you want uh but it was fantastic. And I had to like set my parking brake really hard in the four rows. So <laughs> I was going to sleep Just in to the be back. Sure. I had the, yeah. the rear open so I could see out the canyon. And it was like, it, this parking brake better hold. Right. You see I that? that I got a rock. So I, I you know, I, I supplemented. Yeah. Every Even- time I see pictures of people camping against like Powell, they, you know, they park close enough so that it looks like they're parked against the ledge and my thought is uh, i hope the parking brake shoes are good because i've had vehicles where there was no parking brake shoe <laughs> I, yeah. I was only 10 feet from the from the lip. only yeah. only yeah and that's uh, the only way if you're if you're going to go do this without giving yeah. away the, without giving away the exact location you have to find epic spots 
and uh and definitely uh make it worth the trip i mean you know oh, it's yeah. the uh it, it, i think that's been that's been kind of you know whether we've gone to joshua tree or whether we've gone to the white mountains or the grand canyon um it's it's all about uh um you know what you're going to find at the end of the trail and and uh you know it's that uh, you know it, it's one of these things it's like um you know you keep trying to uh, uh, find a new, you know, you keep trying to set a new record. And I think in this case with, with overlanding and camping, it's like, all right, where's the, where, where's the next trip going to take us? That's going to be like, you know, those epic vistas, um, that, you know, you can really only get to with, uh, an overlanding rig, you know, of some type where you, where you've, you know, where you actually, <laughs> the truck may be sophisticated, but you, you definitely earned the uh, destination. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, the term overlanding is, you know, has come into being since I started doing this. And, uh, you know, it was just, I went camping in my Jeep or my Forerunner. But I mean, I kind of like, I, I kind of like the whole thing. Well, you know, it's a little bit more, I'm going to go and push it a little bit on the road. And I don't know what kind of conditions I'm going to find. So I need a vehicle that has enough capability that if there's a washout or something, because this trail isn't used very often, that I can get to where I want to go and deal with, you know, mm -hmm. it's not like you're driving dirt roads to a mountain bike trailhead. It's right. a little more yeah, than it's, that. It's not, it's not state forest roads or something like that. And there's so much open land west of the Rockies. You just can't believe how much it is. I mean, I remember, at Edmonds, we hired a video producer who grew up in New York and, you know, we took him to an off-road shoot and he's like, we can do this. You don't have to have permission. We can just go here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, it's very far in for, you know, Eastern seaboard type mentality. So yeah, what's, a, what's the toughest off-roading that you guys have done to get to a campsite? <laughs> Mike's probably got a better story there. I mean, always a good question when there's silence after. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a good. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, hmm, I got to. I got to think about that one because there have been, okay. there have been there there have been cases. I know, like the you know, it, it's not so much difficulty like the Grand Canyon one that we were just talking about is about you're you're going about thirty miles uh, one way to get to the destination. So you're, you're, you know, you're off road the entire time. And, uh, you know, there are definitely areas where mud, depending on the time of the season is, is a risk, right. Getting stuck in the mud. Um, I, I don't know. It's, uh, that's it. Yeah. Go ahead, Dan. Well, I've got one that doesn't involve Mike. Uh, I was <laughs> in, in Moab and at the time I had, you know, that two door Jeep, and uh, I had driven it there for a Jeep event. And at some point, two of the guys, I think it was uh, a couple of journalists, took one of the Jeep Jeeps and went to a place called the Maze District in Canyonlands National Park. Mm, and the Maze District, Canyonlands spot. National Park is my favorite. It's huge. It's by, you know, there's the Green River and the Colorado River that come together. And then, you know, two red, rivers enter one river leaves and that's the mm -hmm. Colorado and each quad uh, I guess it wouldn't be a quadrant but each of those three districts is a completely different part of the national park and the maze district is the least visited by far and that was some pretty hairy off-roading to get to where these guys were. Now, the reason I went there is they had said, hey, why don't you come with us? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I got this BF Goodrich thing I wanted to do. I was trying to butter some up, somebody up for some tires or something. <laughs> and and uh, so they went. And then I realized that my hat was in the car they took because that was the car I had driven on the press event the day before. So I'm like, well, I'm going to go get my hat. So I did this huge 200 mile. Oh if you look at the God. map from Moab, <laughs> Hanksville to the Maze District, it was this huge thing. And then the last 30 miles was was like really iffy. The trail was like you're looking for like black rub marks on the sandstone and cairns. Mm -hmm. And it was like, am I in the right place? And yeah. And, and then I finally got to where they were and then they were off hiking somewhere and the wind was blowing and their tent was like flat. 
Oh, oh no. my God. Uh, <laughs> but it was, it was nuts. And that's a great place. I'd love to go back to the maze. District. The maze. Just incredible. The ma- yeah. yeah the Can- maze is- Canyonlands. That whole area is, is pretty spectacular. It's one of those yeah. places that you hear about and you hear about and you hear about, and it just stays on the bucket list, you know? Yeah. And I want to do the white rim Jeep trail, which is the, 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 this district, the, which is the Island in the sky. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like driving. If you're ever at the grand Canyon and look down, you see like a kind of a plateau about halfway down. And then it goes to the river after that. That's kind of the white rim. It's kind of like part way down but it's really a narrow shelf, a little white rim of a certain type of stone. And you're just driving along that for like 105 miles. It's nuts. I mean, it's- Yeah, that's the one you need. Um, uh, white rim trail is, uh, it, it, it's about a hundred and, I think it's about 120 miles long and you do need permits to camp along right. the trail. Like that's okay. one that you don't want to do as like a marathon push. It would, it would not be a very fun day. Um, no. <laughs> so you definitely want to take at least two two nights to do it, and to do so, you need to get your permit in through Canyonlands, and uh, you know the permitting process. They only allow, I think, a total of uh, ten vehicles. Um, I think it's ten vehicles max on the trail per day. It's something. It's something super limited. So you know wow. when you go, it's going to be a special occasion, um, and uh, you've got to get the you know, you've got to get the campground. I, I, I got to look back into it. Every time I look to get the, the dates, if you don't make the move for the permitting in the first couple of minutes, you're going to be out of luck. What? Yeah. I've, I've, I've done like the start of it to a place called Muscleman Arch and then turned around and came back out, you know, and that's like doing a 12th of it, you know, but just mm-hmm. to get a feel for it. And it's it's fantastic. I've never done the whole thing because of the permitting issue and you know getting. Yeah, damn. Maybe we can go this weekend. I'm thinking about. Leaving. <laughs> yeah, let's. <laughs> We're leaving tomorrow morning. Throw some stuff yeah. in a bag. I'm thinking about leaving Saturday. I'm thinking about leaving Saturday morning, and maybe maybe we can get back Sunday night. Man. Yeah, that'd be fine. What's that crazy trail in Moab that hugs a wall, and there's a huge step, and there's a cliff on the left side as you're going down, and it. It's, it's a Jeep trail or a mountain bike trail? It's a Jeep trail. I mean, you can mountain bike it if you want to, I guess. Because Portal in Moab is terrifying, but that's more mountain bike. Oh, God. It's... That one doesn't ring a bell, but I have Cliffhanger? Been... Is it Cliffhanger? Well, it sounds like it would be. Yeah. <laughs> as, as the words come out of my mouth, yeah. I'm going to go with that. But no, I haven't, I haven't done all the trails in Moab. There's just so many. And... Uh, you know, I'm never, I've never been there for the whole week. I've usually just come in for a night or two. Hmm. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, I'll go to Canyonlands while the zoo is going on in Moab because, you know, there's a video we shot uh, for Car and Driver uh, at Moab last year where it's, it's Easter Jeep Safari, but we're by ourselves on trails because hmm. we just, went to Canyonlands and really only about eight miles away from Moab, but everybody's down there. So it's, there's so much open space out there. And that's, what's great about overlanding, even though a lot of people seem to be into it, uh, you can still get away from it all and not see anybody out there. Yeah. I, I think that's the, that's the, that's the, I think Dan's nailed it. I mean, that's the part that is really the most addicting part of this is that, um, you can always find a trail that you've never been on before. That's going to take you to a place that's probably quite epic. And mm-hmm. even just trying to explore like California, uh, I, which, which I personally have been doing for years, I still discover new trails, like all the time that I've never been on. And yeah. then you think about, mm-hmm. you think about how lucky we are to live west of the Mississippi and that we do have all of this um, mm-hmm. public land space um, to, to go off and explore with, uh, with the BLM. Even if you watch things like, uh, like the rebel rally, like I'm always impressed at Emily Miller and the team at the rebel rally, yep. because Emily is constantly searching for new parts of the BLM, uh, now into Nevada that I look at the, I look at these pictures from the, from, uh, from the rebel. And I'm like, Oh man, I need to go check that part out. And that would be the Bureau of land management because yes, th- yes. that's, 
Yes. 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 Right. yes. Right. We haven't had Emily on, but we have become the unofficial podcast of the Rebel we, Rally. We literally based on how it's many, mentioned every episode. <laughs> and oh, that's based great. on how yeah, many I, guests we've had who have run it or been involved yeah. with it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you need to get Emily on. Emily, I, I've known Emily for about 15 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, she is, um, uh, you know, sh- she is um, as authentic and uh, a, a pioneering off-road um, uh, explorer as, as there ever was. I, I, I'm in absolute awe of what she's done with the Rebel Rally. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. And I feel like it's the right time of year to contact her since that doesn't happen until the fall. Like now is maybe a little downtime for her, hopefully. <laughs> Well, she's doing the training now for the next class that's going oh to do God. the rebel. So, mm-hmm. uh, good, definitely a good time to get hold of Emily. You, sh- you guys should definitely have her on the show. Yeah, absolutely. We would love to, Emily. If you're listening, <laughs> no time like now. <laughs> so, um, Mike, when you are facing a weekend in which you are, or a week, weekday, whenever it is that you think. You have the prospect of going away um, with a trip that involves Dan or doesn't involve Dan. How do you decide what vehicle you're going to take? We, I mean, we know we have your own Ranger, but I mean, we've seen you know pictures you've posted of countless vehicles from the Ford fleet. How do you pick and choose? Uh, I mean, it, it look it totally depends. Um if uh um you know if it's something new and and uh uh take uh bronco raptor for example uh obviously i i'm c- completely in awe of bronco raptor um you know just uh i'll grab hopefully one of my kids if dan's not available i usually uh, deputize one of my kids to come with me and uh <laughs> hold the camera and, uh, you don't have a choice <laughs> and, yeah exa- exactly and uh we'll take them uh, we'll take them camping and and really just to get a sense for me to take a vehicle and disappear off into the mountains for a day or two days or three days gets me much better acquainted with the vehicle than even just like a one day driving program. Um, mm-hmm. Just so I can, you know, if I'm going to talk to other, uh, um, you know, journalists about it, um, I don't want to be talking about it just off a spec sheet. I want to be talking about it because I've actually taken the vehicle and pushed mm-hmm. it to see what it can do and what the, um, oh my. you know, what the pros uh, yeah. pros and cons are with the, with the vehicle, just so I can kind of rank it in my head of where, where it sits. Like I'll give you one quick example, like Bronco Raptor, absolutely fantastic for going just about anywhere. Like it is an unstoppable, um, beast of a vehicle. Would I take it camping for, uh, more than an overnight trip? I'd have to think about that a bit more because what I can do with my Ranger uh, is, uh, with the cargo box is I can fit a whole bunch more gear in the back and I can still take, uh, three or four people with me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't get quite that space luxury conveniently in a Bronco Raptor. So there's definitely pick your, uh, pick your vehicle. Well, depending on what your, what trip you're about to go off and do. Yep. Mike, what tent do you use? Uh, well, I've got a ground tent. It's, uh, you got it right there. It's the shift pod. Because uh, okay. I always get asked about it. Usually, people just think of it as space camping. That's what it um, looks like. <laughs> it really does. It, yeah, it looks like you've transported Mars onto your uh, onto the ground behind the Ranger in this space. Yeah, it's a really cool, really cool company. They're out in Northern California. Um, you may have seen them at like um, uh, I know they're pretty popular. Burning Man. Anyway, the the advantage of it is um, it sets up in about two minutes. You, you throw down a floor in the tent and you're ready to go. You don't have to worry about all the poles mm-hmm. and all that stuff. It's just so to me, to me, the most valuable yeah. thing is how quickly can I set up a tent and then start to enjoy the weekend versus me wrestling with a tent, trying to, trying to get it set up. That's yeah. why rooftop tents exist. Tr- people, absolutely true. And there's because, there pros and yeah. cons with rooftop tents. Uh, more cons than pros, but we, but we love them. We that. do love them, you know, uh, there's um there's a a counterculture for people going back to ground tents and in, in the pop up tents these days, and it's very interesting to see as uh, as the media and the uh, the overlanding um, fame comes with the rooftop tents. 
Yeah, it, it's uh, it's it's definitely a pendulum. Uh, and and I'll say this because because Dan has camped inside of his forerunner before. I'm like, oh man, then I don't have to keep opening up this tent and popping it back up, and I don't have to worry about a rooftop tent. I can just kind of you know sleep in the back of the sleep in the back of the truck, which is a whole thing unto itself for some benefits. Ross was trying to yeah. convince me recently to uh, buy a fairly cheap Chevy Avalanche with a bed cover with the mid gate that folds down and use that to sleep through. <laughs> Remember that avalanche we were talking about before, Dan? This is the same avalanche. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, for me in the in you know in the Forerunner, uh, you know, it's got kind of a weird folding seat where yeah, you know, you fold this one up and then this one down. Mm-hmm. And, and the so rest what, I, what I do is before I go home is I take this bottom piece out because it's just two bolts. Mm-hmm. Then when I fold this down, this thing isn't there. And so it makes it like six inches longer and I'm six two. And so I just stack all my belongings behind the 40% seat. And then mm-hmm. I sleep on the 60% side. Oh yeah. And I, Have- I did that on the, uh, in a, in a, in a, a rank, a JL, uh, UR, um, okay. on the Mojave road and, uh, the same sort of thing. Uh, but I am kind of looking pretty hard at a uh, at a rooftop tent, specifically the Go Fast Camper, the GFC, because I really like the way that kind of replaces the roof rack mm-hmm. and kind of becomes its own roof rack that you can bolt stuff to. It's pretty low profile and really well made, but you know, it's also GFC makes very very nice equipment as does like iCamper and whatnot. I'm curious why though you, have you considered, so the Forerunner is like a, a 60-40, like a two seats and a single yeah. seat split. Have you considered like a platform, like a sleeping platform kind of deal where you- Yeah, I don't want to remove my seats, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I, I know that, uh, oh, what's the big company that's right in Costa Mesa that does all the platforms? I was to say Goose Gear, but I don't know. Goose, yeah, Goose no, Gear's okay. like the big one, yeah. Yeah, no, they make some great platforms, but you got to do seat deletes. And, mm. you know, I still want to have a four-seat forerunner. So by just mm. pulling out that bottom cushion on the 60% side with two bolts just before I leave, I can kind of create a sleeping, sleeping pack platform. The only problem is the forerunner kind of does a little one-inch step near the back, you mm-hmm. know, where they have their pull-out slide option, which I don't have. Yep. And I would probably I really like, really yeah, nice I tool. didn't get it, but uh, I, I, I would probably put a piece of marine plywood in there to make it level and then yep. end up with yep. the same thing. But, you know, I, I'll tell you who, who has a really great setup. And I think it's probably the best setup that I've seen yet is Michael Weber, who is overland under budget on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And uh, Micah has a um, older Tacoma and he took the cargo box off and, Micah completely fabricated like a camper shell for the back of his Tacoma. So it's become like this enclosed sleeping platform back Mm -hmm. there. And it has like, and now he's integrated a a pop-up roof to it, but you don't need to pop up the roof to, to sleep in it. It's the, the shell itself is the, is both the storage and the cargo box. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there's a, there's a picture of it right there. And I think like you can see with the sides up, I think the work that Micah has done on that is is absolutely fantastic, and you can see he's even really uh, integrated. Yeah, he's got Pelican That's boxes beautiful. that he yeah. fits underneath the uh, custom. He he's yeah. done this all 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 by himself, and uh, um, that, I mean, is that, that is truly an epic overlanding rig. FJ Steel is too, very very yep. nice. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice looking that's rig. Very good. Yeah, I. I I would just do like a single twin, like single person inflatable mattress in the back of the truck and call it, (laughs) you know, like this is, this setup that we're seeing on screen is incredible for somebody who spends significant time in their vehicle, you know, Yep. like that's not daily driver unless it's just, you know, around town and presumably he's just commuting around Seattle based on the way that looks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've done a lot of backpacking and, you know, ground tents and that, but, you know, especially out here in the desert, the, the ground could be pretty rocky. 
and uh, you can spend a lot of time clearing a spot. Maybe you are in a place where you probably shouldn't clear a spot. You can just kind of park wherever you want if you sleep in your vehicle or if you have a rooftop, rooftop tent. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, everybody has their own preference, that's for sure. Yeah, Every, that, 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 is, that is absolutely right. We could, we could spend a whole episode, I could spend a whole episode just, just trying to debate the merits of blow up mattresses versus uh, foam mattresses. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and what's the better way to do it? Cause I'll tell you what, one other thing I've just come across and, and, uh, with, the uh, uh, blow up pads is, uh, they're amazing for insulation. Uh, but I just got a, a USB powered little pump to, uh, to, uh, blow up the uh, air mattress. And, and I got to tell you, <laughs> that thing is, it's like a life changer. Like, Oh wait, I don't need to oh breathe into this thing to, to pump it up and right. hand pump it. I can just take this little tiny USB thing that, uh, and it's just these little these little tips and tricks as you start to go camping, uh, whether it's ground or or rooftop or whatever, the things that make the difference between really enjoying the time out there or <laughs> worrying about how much time you got to spend setting this stuff up. Well, there was the trip back to that Grand Canyon overlook that I couldn't go on, where you guys saw the condor, and it oh, was yeah, like yeah, yeah, it was like really super cold, and you were telling me something about you got like a cubicle heater and you had rigged up something to have heat in your tent. Oh, so Easily. that's, that is, so that's another game changer. Yeah. So, so quickly, um, I've, I've gone to solar. I started with solar for a Dometic, uh, refrigerator. Cause mm -hmm. once you go with a Dometic and you, you don't have to fill a, a cooler with ice, you don't worry about your food floating on water, you know, 24 hours later. Um, so first thing was the first thing that led to a better sleeping experience was getting a refrigerator <laughs> and then using the solar panels and then discovering batteries, uh, just how great the batteries have gotten with solar recharging. And then finally getting a, a large enough battery to run like a hundred, a uh, hundred watt, 150 watt, you know, kind of desk heater all night in the tent. And it was the difference between outside, I think it was about 20 degrees. And inside the tent with the heater running all night with the battery off the solar, uh, it was probably about 60 degrees inside the tent. Like, oh, wow. Um, That's game, amazing. Total, total game changer. Complete 60 game changer. degrees. Oh, my God. That's hot. That's, that's luxury. That's crazy. Oh, that is luxury. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Especially for winter camping. Seriously. Yeah. I mean, the akin to that, the technologies that we're seeing, like yesterday, I, I, finally got one of those brick uh usb plug-in jump starters it's like a you know a yeah just in case eight by four thing that has jump cables that you plug into it and it's like i never could have imagined something like that you know in the same way that you're camping in 60 degree heat when it's 20 degrees outside like the advancements are crazy and and the solar too like uh, could you have imagined a dometic fridge keeping your food cool no you know it's 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 really um it's, it's game changing it, it makes you think about the way you off-road and the way you overland completely differently um have you guys and and this is something that has come up recently i'm curious if either of you think it's for the worse because part of the joy of off-roading is isolating yourself from your normal daily life and eliminating those things that make daily life comfortable and normal and connected so i mean this might be an asinine question but do either of you find any um like over normalcy in the luxuries that come from modern technology? Dan, you want to go? Well, the answer could just be no. You could no, just say I no. <laughs> I'm there. I'm there to see, you know, the cool landscapes and the geology and, you know, get away from it all and having a little bit of heat. <laughs> it doesn't really doesn't really change that. I don't want to it's not me trying to punish myself mm -hmm. i just want to see some cool stuff and 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 kind of get away from it all but but heat isn't it all that i'm trying to get away from mm -hmm. you know i'm not gonna like 
play my boom box tunes because that kind of crosses that line. But I'll Are use those people kind of thing to start a match and I'll have lights, you know, if I need them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, it's not about, you know, rolling back the clock a hundred years. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, I think I think Dan's spot on. It's not like we're trying to be uh, uh, in Conestoga wagons, you know, <laughs> not trying to be pioneers. The range here. Yeah, this isn't yeah, the Oregon not... Trail. Yeah, no. I, I think Dan, I think Dan nailed it. I mean, the, the, the point is to, um, you know, cause the same could be said about all the great capabilities that come with today's vehicles. Like, you know, I've got a weekend free. Um, hopefully Dan will have a weekend free so I can bug him to go camping with me. And, you know, it's the way to kind of, um, recharge after, um, you know, working a work week, whether it's working from home during the freaking pandemic, where we were just looking at the same walls every day or going mm-hmm. through, you know, a, a really, um, intense work period, you just want to, you want to get outdoors and just kind of rejuvenate. And um, that doesn't mean that you need to um, deprive yourself <laughs> of at least having like a halfway decent meal of some, you know, of, of uh, mm. uh, you know, take, take a couple of burgers. Um, you know, certainly you can cook them over, uh, uh, over the campfire or, you know, you'd whip out the propane stove and, you know, cook them a little bit faster and stuff like that. It's, it's, you know, it's the whole experience without like, I can't imagine I'd ever, uh, I, well, let me just be clear. I would never bring a television set with me. Like that would defeat the whole nature. Like <laughs> yeah, right. I, I might as well just be sitting at home watching an Apple, Apple TV wallpaper go by. Right. Yeah. I'm not going out um, there to watch Ted Lasso or anything, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You're Although not going we out absolutely will all watch Ted Lasso. Well, yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> Just, just not when there's a choice between Ted Lasso or a, uh, or a California you condor. A condor. No. <laughs> you got <laughs> condor pictures there, right? <laughs> uh, if he's got condor pictures, I'm pretty far down. I haven't found them yet. Mm. Okay, I don't remember what month that was on Mike's feed. I don't know. They'd probably be a little bit, maybe a little bit closer to the, to the, to the top. But that, that's like seeing. But see, that's the type of thing that makes really getting out into the middle of nowhere, like so worth the trip to get out there because yeah. first of all, you don't know what you're going to run into, whether it's bighorn sheep um, or a California condor and the California condor pretty much borders on like a religious experience because the thing is, you know, it's, 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 it's like watching a dinosaur. It's got a, a, like the wingspan must've been eight feet. Um, yeah. And just, and it's looking at you as intently as you're watching it and you realize I may not be quite the quite as near to the top of the food chain uh, as yeah. as uh, as I might think I am out here in the middle of nowhere. He's <laughs> trying to size up your health and see if he can uh, help you. <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. and then uh, take into account, you know, that pterodactyls or, or pterodon had a wingspan of like 40 to 44 feet. <laughs> right. Yeah, the, the condor, the coolest part about the condor besides the size and the rarity of it was you could hear it moving the air with its wings. Like you could, oh, wow. you could literally hear the air moving around it as it circled us a couple of times to Dan's point to check out our health and see if it was going to have a meal in a couple hours. <laughs> That's crazy. I, I ran into a couple juveniles the last time I was at the Grand Canyon. Wow. Um, but they were just, they, they were like literally just right on the rocks there, right by the South Village. And the amount of people that were like, over fences that were too close i'm like what are you nuts doing calm down <laughs> get out of the way let them just yeah. live it's another reason to get out there and, and find the trails to go off and explore and uh you know get to the spots that are you know the rare spots but you know still have some of the conveniences to make sure yeah. you're going to enjoy the trip yeah wildlife is definitely a factor that uh people who see the off-roading and overlanding culture from the outside don't expect um, like in the Northeast, we have moose and wolf, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like they're very present when you least expect it. So, yeah, it's a it's a See, special, I, special thing that I, that. I thought you were going to pivot wildlife into hammers. <laughs> well, that's that, a different kind of wildlife. That exactly. That's where a, that's where I thought he was going. That's a, that's a whole Thank other, you for, that's a whole yeah. other discussion. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is a pickup, and 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 thank you for uh, for teeing that up and taking the line. Let's let's talk hammers. So, um, 
So Mike, we uh, we've had Vaughn on the show, and and we Lauren, know that, and Lauren, yeah, we know Hammers went well. So can you tell us about your experience and uh, and what Hammers means to Ford? Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, King of the Hammers is one of the, if not the coolest, off road uh, event with many, many people that, that there is right now. I just think it's such an impressive um, uh, spectacle uh, to see. Mm-hmm. And, and a reason for that is one is it combines the best of like, um, you know, go fast desert racing, but it also throws in there extreme rock crawling. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you see these uh, custom made rigs that, you know, people may have fabricated in their garage that look like moon buggies um that uh um uh are competing in in king of the hammer so it has a very much a grassroots uh feel to it um for ford we've gotten involved uh from the bronco side um just because uh, a couple of years ago even before bronco went on sale um you know bronco was developed in johnson valley which is home of king of the hammers Mm -hmm. so on many of the same uh um dune and and rock courses the whooped whooped out portions of johnson valley like that's where our team has actually gone out and developed bronco so bronco has kind of a natural fit in in johnson valley and it's very much like it's gotten to the point where when you look at bronco raptor we made a specific point with bronco raptor that it is the world's first ultra four inspired suv and ultra four racing is what um is what happens in King of the Hammers and other uh, events within the Ultra Four Racing mm-hmm. Series. Um, so it's this notion of combining the best of going fast and that extreme rock crawling into one. But what makes King of the Hammers go that extra mile? I think that's so cool. Is um, at night after the racing is done, um, it's on Bureau of Land Management public land, and the race course closes, and then it becomes public land is, again, essentially. So you will see the spectators immediately flock onto some of the most challenging parts of the courses with their home built rigs and try to run up those same challenges. It would be like going to the Daytona uh, 500. And after NASCAR is done for the day, they just say to the spectators, okay, yep. track's yours. Whoever wants to go out and race at the, you know, the track, <laughs> go for it. I mean, it's that type of for like, better or worse. Complete... It's the, it is the ultimate hold my beer and watch this. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, that's exactly. It's it's so much fun and and so challenging and so grassroots and it all comes together. So the crossover between racing and production vehicles isn't new to Ford. I mean, you guys have done uh, F one fifty and Baja. You know, you know. There's been like Raptor Baja crossovers, and then now there's the Bronco crossover, is there a clear defined way that this makes it from what you learn and see in the off-road racing community to production vehicles, the way that everybody speculates and theorizes that F1 cars have trickle down stuff to like street cars, you know, is, is this R and D? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the short answer is yes. And this actually, this goes all the way back to like Henry Ford and the sweepstakes um, race uh, race car that he had to raise money to, to start Ford Motor Company. Like motorsports has been that much of at Ford's mission. Um, but you can, w- what you see is just like Rod Hall won the Baja 1000 back in 1969 and was the only racer to ever, uh, he and Larry Miner were the only racers to ever win with a stock four by four, the overall Baja 1000. Today, what you'll see is we're actually taking, uh, we've got this Bronco DR, the desert racer truck. And that, what makes that so compelling is it is a not street legal turnkey truck that's meant to go race the Baja 1000. But the parts that are in it are a 10 speed transmission from the F 150, the five liter Coyote V8 from both Mustang and F 150. The frame is a stock frame from the mm-hmm. Michigan assembly plant assembly line for, for Bronco. So it's almost like I, I, you know, you would say it was trickled down from racing to stock vehicles. I would tell you it goes both ways because now you're seeing this turnkey desert racer that's using all these stock parts that we know have been proven in F-150 uh, and Bronco um, out in places like Johnson Valley. Um, and then you see some of these learnings come back 
to make a vehicle or inspire a vehicle like a Bronco Raptor that's a much more uh, affordable version of a, of a Bronco DR that is street legal. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And some of our past guests have driven it recently. I think Emmy. Emmy just had it. it, yeah. yeah. Um, next question. If Dan walked up to you and full-on Matrix style said red pill or blue pill, would you rather take that Bronco, the DR, into Baja together or do hammers together? Which would you pick? And Dan can also answer this. Oh, oh man. I think I have to go. This is too difficult of a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I mean, you, this is something that you could possibly employ and, and make a reality should you want. Man, hammers is so tempting. But I have to say... Uh, I I pre-run the the 500 with Ivan Stewart and that was incredible. I would I think the the long form high speed I mean I love rock crawling but uh, I I I think the long form like into the night wake up again and still going on you know with co-drivers and all that I love the teamwork mm-hmm. aspect of that. We Hammer yeah, seems so a- technical. Yeah. That, that's it's a country. I know. We've had we've had a bunch of people in the Baja community that have come on the show. I mean, um Kurt Williams from Cruiser Outfitters and the Land Cruiser Museum, you know, Kangaroo Racing has run Baja. And we had Larry Chen on talking about Baja. And we have Lauren talking about, you know, hammers, and we've had countless people talking about hammers and, and Levi. Is, and, and Levi, and it's, it's just, it's such a testament to how far the interest in four-wheel drive has come over the last 20 years, you know? Um, when I think back to my childhood, it was either, it was rally racing or it was Baja. There was like no you know, in between. And, and it's really exciting to see how, how far things have come. I mean, Dan was just on a freaking 9-11 off-road launch, you know, like, how is this a thing, you know? And, yeah. and meanwhile, we have Broncos with like 500 horsepower that you can buy off the dealer lot and, you know, allegedly jump and, uh, then, Something else I did want to talk about that Mike and Dan both might both might be interested in is a uh, a 700 horsepower freaking F-150 with you know with Fox shocks. So it's it's wild. Um, can we talk about Raptor R, please? <laughs> up up yeah. to you guys. <laughs> I've spent time with the TRX and it it, it was. We, we we've talked about this to an endless extent, but but Raptor R seems to be even better. Um, where does Agreed. it go? Where does it go from here? <laughs> <laughs> like, is this this is that's one of the problems with with cars and trucks over the last ten years is like we keep hitting this new level of like of peak truck peak car, you know. Um, like, I, I think you've just discovered next? the third. I think you've just discovered the third leg of what we were just talking about earlier, which would be, you can never have um, uh, 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 too much uh, shielding on your truck. Uh, you can never have too much communications, and uh, <laughs> the third one would probably be you can never have too much suspension travel. Yeah, I, I'd go suspension travel because I like the Raptor non R version just fine, but man, you add the horsepower, it's just insane. And, yeah, uh, a- absolutely. Yeah, you, you combine the horsepower with the uh, with the chassis, and uh, it's a pretty it's a pretty magical combination uh, to uh, you know, especially especially over whoops, um, yeah. you know, around Borrego, like where that truck was developed. Um, that that just goes to show you just how far today's rigs have evolved to take on just about any type of terrain. Um, you just got to, you know, you pick your, you pick your, uh, uh, your rig for what you want to go off and do. Mm-hmm. 
It's so good. Just yeah, and and to your yes. point, Ross, uh, you know the 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 suspension tuning of the TRX just doesn't quite do it for me the way the Raptor setup does. Feels so much more balanced, and I think it's a probably it's a better daily on on the road too. I think some of the things that the that the TRX does don't necessarily translate into a good daily. Uh, and that's and why confirm. I, that's why I think the Raptor is 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 my favorite there. And mm -hmm. I you know I still remember the Dawn Patrol launch thing where we left Pahrump, Nevada before the sun rose to drive oh. to <laughs> and just tear ass around there. And those were some great courses they had set up. And yeah, that was one. Dan Dan joined on a uh, on a uh, special Raptor media drive where if I was going to do it, I told everyone ahead of time. Uh, because it was summertime, but that was the best time to do it. That we were all leaving the hotel at three o'clock in the morning. And I think <laughs> yeah. any media <laughs> before they came with us it was like, if you join us, we are leaving the hotel at three o'clock in the morning to beat the heat uh, yeah. to get the trucks out to uh, out to the dunes. But um, um, yeah, the suspension, the footage. suspension, and the power combination. There's there's really hard to beat. Yeah, and I was going back and forth. Do I want the 35s? Do I want the, the optional 37s? Because, you know, that's a choice when you don't get an R. And, uh, you know, there were certain obstacles where I like the 35s better and other things where the 37s were better. But, you know, I mean, there's more articulation on the 35s just because they let the, the wheels travel a little mm -hmm. bit more. But it doesn't mm -hmm. add up to a whole lot on the ramp, not as much as I thought. Hmm. It is crazy that 37s are an option. I remember the TJ Jeep Rubicon had 33s, and that was like in 2004, that was unheard of, you know? Right. And, and, uh, and then the power wagon came out, and you could fit 35s without a lift. And now, right. you know, now it's 37s, and, and, between well, Raptor and Bronco, like it's it's almost the horsepower wars in a weird yeah. off roady <laughs> way. Um, it, it's it's like who's gonna be the first of forties and fuck what what is that like what is the connotation that comes with well, it? Well, at some you know? point you get a lot of rotating mass and it becomes you know difficult to deal with. <laughs> uh, because <Yeah>. because <laughs> seriously this 37 that you're seeing here on my uh it weighs 108 pounds the tire does the tire, tire, tire. Yeah. yeah 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 and that's without the optional beadlock rim that's with the beadlock trim mm -hmm. ring that you have to take off when you buy the ford performance beadlock ring to go on but yeah that's 108 and a half pounds right there and uh so uh you know, if you went up to 40s, what would that be? <laughs> but just, well, yeah, just this... we know what it is. I mean, it's not just the additional, you know, unsprung mass. It's also the wear and tear that it takes on, you know, brakes and CVs and diffs and everything that travels between them. Like it's 130 ish yeah. pounds. <laughs> you know? By the way, uh, you know, that. Those those that ramp test is something I feature on my YouTube channel, and I've because I took a full time gig with Car and Driver just over a year ago. My YouTube mm -hmm. channel production's been a little bit light, but uh, I have shipped some footage to Car and Driver's video edit team, and actually there is a Raptor R suspension deep dive and ramp test. That is in final edit that might show up. Ooh, I need to Maybe do by the time this airs, it'll Good. already be up. <laughs> Nerds like <laughs> us need more of that content. And and this is this is like I said, this is what makes I think suspension the new horsepower for off-road vehicles because it really is the combination of you know wheel and tire, wheel and tire choice, suspension, uh, suspension technology. Are you talking? You know, is it is it internal bypass? Is it uh, spool driven suspension? Uh, you know, there's just mm -hmm. there's such a new frontier um, of 
technology that's being applied to off-road. And it really does come down to trying to figure out what are you going to do most with the vehicle that you're about to to purchase to make sure that you know you're you're buying the right you know right tool for the right trail um, to have the you know best experience. Right. Well, and that, you know, I think I said it earlier. I love the Raptor that doesn't have 700 horsepower. And the difference between the Raptor R and the regular Raptor is 300 horsepower or so. <laughs> But I mean, the suspension is what, you know, I mean, I can get into a lot of trouble with a base Raptor and, Mm -hmm. or, or, or avoid a lot of trouble with a base Raptor because the suspension, I mean, that's, well, of course I'm biased because I, I, I have a suspension background and development and, you know, uh, engines are great and horsepower is awesome, but (laughs) suspension is what's going to help you put it down to the ground and, Mm -hmm. you know, make time. Power yeah, the and biggest, torque mean nothing if you can't actually do anything with it. Right. Yep, that's totally true. I, th- I think where, where the 700 horsepower really pays off in particular for Raptor is in sand. And the fact that, yeah. I mean, you could just go into uh, so many different scenarios of like dunes and know that, um, you know, airing down uh, and having all that power that, um, you're, you're just going to, you're, you're going to, you're going to claw your way out and you're going to float over just about any type of scenario. And you're going to be able to climb really steep dunes. Um, and that's where that horsepower, um, really comes to pay off is in that particular, you know, sand dune scenario. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that, that's interesting because I had a very similar, uh, experience, you know, with that 911 Dakar in Morocco. We went to a big sand dune formation called Air Gachebi, which is basically like Glamis. Picture Glamis and you're there. And Glamis in Morocco. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, we flew to Erechidia and drove to Air Gachebi, but that's like flying to Yuma, Arizona and driving to Glamis. <laughs> and, Amazing. Uh, yeah, just and uh, yeah, life. that's what we did. But, but I mean, here's a, a vehicle that's built on the GTS. So it's got a whole ton of horsepower and an all-wheel drive system, but it weighs 3,400 pounds. So, I mean, it doesn't have 700 horsepower, but it also doesn't weigh as much. So, I mean, the power to weight ratio might be kind of similar, but that thing was a much more of a dune buggy than I, ex- I don't know what I expected when I went to go drive that thing, but it was just a laugh riot in the sand. And you know, we're just laughing out loud in the car saying, I can't believe I'm doing this in a 911. I mean, that was pretty much, you know, on repeat in the car. It just, mm-hmm. it was just, it was nuts. Well, you guys have heard the trope about, you know, around a given track, the Corvette will out accelerate anything from corner to corner, and then the Miata will catch it and keep up in the turns and rinse. I've lived that. Yeah, yeah, of, of anybody you've lifted, but it's <laughs> it's it's the utter application of it. It's not what you do with the power; it's how you use it, you know. And it's it's what kind of fun you have with it too. I mean, we're seeing you know the trickle down from the huge horsepower wars and huge suspension wars um from f-150 raptor to you know ranger raptor now and and bronco raptor in the same way that it's it's happening across all of the other companies and it's um it's it's setting a new standard which is becoming of increasing concern on on the um writing a check front but also (laughs) Uh, for Who you know checks yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> also that it's becoming of increasing concern for the people who make checks <laughs> you, you yeah. mentioned ranger raptor and i think i'm really looking forward to that because i know mike probably remembers this trail on the white mountains that we went to where when we left it was pretty much I wouldn't say it was the worst desert stripe I've ever seen, but it was pretty good. And I'm thinking taking a Raptor through here would just be, you know, difficult, but a, 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 a Ranger Raptor, 
you know, might be just right sized enough to yeah. uh, to get through that trail. I don't know if you remember that one, Mike, but. Oh, no, no. I, I when We were talking earlier about the what was the most difficult trail that we've been on. Mm -hmm. What immediately flashed back was, was when we went the other direction and uh, we went through that sagebrush for like miles. Yeah. And I had my forerunner was still pretty new and didn't have any scratches on it yet. I was like, uh... <laughs> yeah, we it's classify uh, we classify trails in the northeast by full width or midsize. So, yeah get it well this was definitely not raptor friendly this trailer or trx friendly or you know yeah or full-size truck trend turn and radius friendly. friendly yeah yeah um that said i do want to touch at least quickly on electrification and and the evs as they come into the off-road four by four truck suv pickup world um i know dan you just spent time with the R1T, or at least sometime in the last, since we spoke last, spent time with the R1T. Mm -hmm. um, I spent a week with the F-150 Lightning last mm -hmm. fall and put uh, about a thousand pounds worth of Polaris in the back. Um, I'm curious, as we move towards um, the the general public accepting and understanding what EVs mean for normal vehicular use, how you guys think about this in terms of off-roading and overlanding, because the two of you have a, a special use case that does fall into a niche, but also does forebode what normal people will seek in their vehicles so I, i'm just curious how you think about it and, and what you expect coming forward um well i mean i like you said i've done some r1t off-roading i also took a jaguar i-pace up a mountain road uh near here saddleback you know uh jeff so Blucker knows it very well yes and, he does uh, yes and it was like a 22 inch wheels with 30 series tires so the tires and wheels were it was total wheel peril yeah there it is and is, wait that's the the normal thing that glucker does his videos on well it yeah there's oh. there's there's more difficult stuff too but i mean uh it's really close to his house i i mean but <laughs> the point is um hi jeff i i loved the idea of off-roading, I just was completely taken by the experience. You mentioned the critters and all of that. So driving up this trail, I'm hearing water in creeks I never heard before. I'm hearing like birds while I'm driving by with the windows down because, you know, in my, in my JK, I'm in low range. The fan, you know how Jeep fans are, is just all you hear is sound. You feel like this thing's mm -hmm. got a propeller that's pulling you up the hill. Uh, I mean, that's how much noise it's making. Uh, but in the Jaguar and the Rivian, it's like you're actually hearing water and wind and animals and you're not scaring stuff away as you approach. A problem was hikers coming down the hill or cars coming the other way can't hear you. But that's, you know, that's usually the case anyway, because they have their own motor noise drowning out the environment. Yeah, and but uh, and conversations and whatnot. I, 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 lo I love the idea of it. And then there's the torque uh, and the fact that it's dual motor, all wheel drive, and you just go. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to, uh, you know, I don't want to say you don't have to put it in low range, but I mean, there's so much low end torque and it's just one gear. It's just utterly smooth. And then all the way down the mountain, I'm regenerating and I'm just using, you know, the one pedal driving coming down. You can just like creep through creeks and out the other side. It's the, the actual driving part is pretty outstanding. Now, you know, I have my, my qualms with the, the Rivian and the way the suspension works. I think that McLaren drive system is a little too uh, clever for its own good. And I'm not sure if I like four motors, I think I'd rather have two, um, because there's always this thinking going on between the left and right side. And it seems like, you know, it's not just doing what I want it to do. It's interpreting what I want to do and then mm -hmm. calculating the result. And it's not always getting it right. It has more, more brains than it has. Yeah. But yeah. the, you know, it's going to come down to range 
and I think range is an issue we solve along the way. Um, because, you know, if you can charge and you have 300 miles of range, you could do the white rim Jeep trail in an, in an EV. If you could fill it up in Moab, mm -hmm. um, you know, you might not be able to do some of the stuff we've done, but I mean, even like going to the North Rim, if we could fill up in, in St. George, Utah, before we get to the last leg, you could do it, mm -hmm. you know. And if you it's have- It's gonna take more fast charging stations and more, uh, you know, more rural or national park adjacent areas, but I think we'll get there. So I don't know, Mike, what do you think? I heard chargers and canab is what I just heard. Yeah. We need chargers and canab. And, and, and I think there are like a limited number of chargers in canab. Like there's like four or five chargers in canab and, and that's it. And um, I, I certainly charging infrastructure is part of it. I would, yeah. I would look at this right now and, I think to the same question that was being asked earlier, which is like, where do you go from a suspension that you have today and the horsepower that you have today? I, I would look at this and I'd look at the uh, new architecture and form factors that EVs can provide um, without having to, you know, put an internal combustion engine in the front. And I think that in 20 years, we're going to look at, you know, the way we would look at Bronco Raptor today or a Porsche to car today and be like, how did they just figure that out? Like, how is that vehicle doing that? I think we'll look back and we'll be like, oh man, that wasn't even, that was like looking at a, uh, you know, at a four by four from 20 years ago and, mm -hmm. and seeing how far we've come. I, I think we're going to see totally new suspension setups, totally new drive trains that are, are more um, connected to what you want to do with the, uh, with the vehicle off-road. Um, I, I just think it, I think electrification is going to open up a whole new side to off-road and off-road capability that isn't possible today uh, with purely internal combustion or, or hybrid powertrains. And then the other thing to kind of bring it back to where we started the conversation in terms of camping is, you know, like, you know, I can, I can take either a lightning or an F-150 power boost and go camping with it. And I don't need solar necessarily because I can draw off of that giant battery pack mm -hmm. um, with the generator and I can, you know, power, uh, you know, uh, lighting, uh, heat, yeah. um, you know, all Electric sorts stove. of different things. Mm -hmm. You know, when you've got 7.2 or 9.6 kilowatts of power at your disposal for a campsite, it's like, you're not just powering your campsite, you're, you're powering all your friends too. So, right. Right. figure out trying to extrapolate where we're going to be like 10 years from now or 20 years from now. I, I just think we're going to look back and we're going to be like, I can't believe we thought those vehicles were so advanced because what we have mm -hmm. 20 years from now is going to make it look like space right. age, something or other. And yeah. the really, really exciting thing from the outside of the industry looking in is the, the increase and proliferation of power density. You know, the same way that we're packing more range and more more power into a given vehicle, you know, who, like a lightning in, in five or 10 years is going to be incredible, you know? Oh, and yeah. It'll, it'll be lighter and it'll be more well, personal. Solid state batteries will, will, will come online at some point and the charging time aspect will kind of cease mm -hmm. to be as big of an issue as it is in people's minds right now. Mm hmm I think there's only, I mean, we're just at the start of this, really. Yes, we exactly. Are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, already, I, though, the actual driving part, the actual off-roading part is great. And, you know, it's yeah. really just going to be charging and range and being able to charge to, just to allow you the freedom to go mm -hmm. where you want. And that'll develop because there's getting to be a critical mass of vehicles that need it. And uh, it'll happen. And it's just great. I, I mean, I really <laughs> enjoyed just the quiet. It, you felt like the, the quiet that you're seeking when you get to the destination, I was also able to enjoy on the way there. Yeah. Right. That I, was, think that's, so I think that's super compelling. I think, Dan, I think you nailed it. Like the fact that you can roll down the window and you'll hear the crunching of gravel um, yes. And when the minute you the minute you stop, mm -hmm. all you hear is 
the wind, whatever that ambient noise is in the outdoors. <laughs> so uh, it's really, it's really cool. After five or 10 years of, of silent daily driving and silent off-roading, do you guys think that you will find, still find excitement and peace and, um, and joy in sports cars and vehicles with loud V8s and open exhausts yes. and manual transmissions? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, Thank you. I'm glad that's the answer. I was going to say, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty hard to beat the intoxicating sound of an F-150 Raptor R. Yeah. And I mean, I've been to a, I used, I, I do a little uh, course marshalling at, at road races, you know, the Long Beach Grand Prix and things like that. And there is a Formula oh, E right. race and uh, that I flagged and like right at the track, you know, communicating with the drivers with flags. And there's like, you know, F1, sons of F1 drivers, retired F1 drivers. Mm -hmm. They're, 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 they're fighting hammer and tong. And I was bored. And, yeah. and, and there was a, a, a mom with her baby kind of behind me and I could hear the baby crying and fussing over the cars as they oh, were no. racing up. I'm, and it's like the, the visceral component of that is just really important. And that really yeah, drove so. that point home. I mean, it, you know, obviously there's excitement in any kind of racing, especially when you're watching it on TV, but the live experience just kind of mm -hmm. wasn't there for me. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there's probably as a spectator, to as a driver, I'm sure it's great for the 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 visual onlooker side of things that will eventually come from away from the scene spectating the way that people have blocked to drive to survive and you know are are watching F1 versus buying tickets, even though we're seeing you know, record Highest ticket attendance. sales yeah. at Coda and, you know, at Silverstone and everything. Um, and, you know, the Vegas stuff selling out, but it, it, it is very interesting. Um, yeah. It, it's a weird world for auto right now. It's about and balance. It's, it's, it's really exciting. Like I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 bite my tongue before I make any grand sweeping statements, but it, aside from the news that came out from the giant Tesla debacle today, like cars and who saw that coming? Yeah. <laughs> everyone. Uh, no, everyone. Literally everybody that doesn't own stock and probably those that don't stock. I'd say everyone who applies critical thinking actually. That's, that's not a large portion of the population anymore, but you know, the, the enthusiast section of the automotive world, at least is in a very good place uh, as is evident by things like the, you know, the Raptor R and the Bronco Raptor and, you know, the, the Ranger Raptor and, um, what I'll say will probably make Mike squirm, but you know, the prospect of all of us holding our breath for a Maverick ST, uh, you know, stuff like that is, is really exciting. And it really keeps us all engaged um, in spite of, you know, uh, another round of Accord hybrids, which I'm sure Dan. It's a, it's a pretty, it's a, it's, it, it is when you stop and think about it for a sec with all the different choices you have, it really is like a golden age for vehicles um, to pick so. what, what you want from a, from a Porsche to car to an F-150 Raptor R <laughs> uh, right. to, uh, to everything, to, to everything in between. Uh, I mean, that's like a, that's a toy box. I, I do want the friend who owns both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Chris, I, I'm, I'm just waiting for you to buy them. Get after yeah. it, man. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I mean, considering, you know, the car 911s are gone for as much as my house. So it's it's crazy. Um, Mike, can we talk about S650 for a couple minutes? Uh, sure. So as somebody who has driven probably 25 of the current outgoing Mustang, what can we expect from the 650? Because 
the literal only thing that I've ever complained about with the existing Mustang is the um, the MT-82 has been a little problematic and I wish it had a 911-esque optional large gas tank. <laughs> That's it. So <laughs> the uh, the 650 has a lot of promises. What can you tell us about it? Uh, I mean, quickly, I would tell you um, I've driven the dark horse. Um, I think that with the fourth gen five liter Coyote, um, the and the uh, oh my god, yep, and the uh, that's crazy, um, and the, the the twin throttle body intake for it. Um, I, I really, it, it to me, it gives the induction a whole new noise, and the exhaust, as we were talking about earlier, um, I just love, love the exhaust note of the um of the uh 24 uh, uh mustang um i also like the fact that we're applying technology so that you'll have remote rev in your pocket so that when you're sitting there drinking your coffee you can always blip the throttle uh, uh using the uh using the key fob to uh to hear the sweet sound of your engine even when you're not behind the wheel um i think the other thing that people are going to really take note of when, once um they uh spend more time with the vehicle is um the digital cockpit like i've I could just tell you that um, the first time I got into Mustang, obviously everyone loves to take Mustang and I've owned several myself and love to drive them and engage with them and do all that. I usually it would have been in the past. Okay. Well, I'm going to start the vehicle up and I'm going to, you know, go to head to Angeles crest. And, you know, I think the first time I got into a new Mustang um, I spent probably about 20, 25 minutes playing with the digital cockpit, just trying to, wrap my head around all the different ways that you can now personalize the car to you digitally mm -hmm. and then save that and um, just completely tailor the vehicle to what you want to do with it. Hmm. You know, and, and that includes, by the way, not just the way it drives, but the fact I love that the designers got, you know, had some fun and, and are bringing back like the, uh, the Fox body gauge cluster. Yeah. It, it's a good look back. I mean, God, I remember the first time I sat in an 05, like a, an early 197 with the change the color of the gauges and the whole ambient lighting. Like it was mind blowing. So yeah. Looking yeah. This just takes it to the next level. I think the, the one thing that I have not tried yet that I'm most looking forward to is the, uh, is the electric drift brake like that mm. to me, like, mm -hmm. you know, you, you were talking earlier about having, you know, Vaughn, uh, getting Junior on, and uh, the fact now that you know Vaughn played a role in the development of this electric drift brake, and uh, man, I, I gotta I gotta try this because it pretty much takes a novice and turns them into like a uh, a Vaughn getting Junior Junior. Yeah, that, <laughs> that goes um, one of two very distinct ways. So hopefully it has been programmed properly. Um, but... track, track use only. Track, track use, only. use only. Yep. Yep. The same way uh, line lock is track use allegedly only. <laughs> it's uh, it's good. It's good. And the um, the reimmersion of the color shift paint is appropriate. Um, we've all probably seen on the internet at some point the uh, tip of your finger change the color of your car kind of stuff. That's you know on the prospect of future. So I don't know. I grew up with the, you know, color shifting terminators. So it's, it's good. It's very good. Um, Dan and Mike, if you could make your dream vehicle out of all the Ford products between engines, <laughs> transmissions, chassis, suspensions, how would you make one and bodies all of the stuff? Oh, don't don't shoes. pigeonhole don't pigeonhole Dan into Ford only. Like I want to hear Dan. I want to hear what Dan's ultimate vehicle well, is. Well, let's do, so uh, for me, this if I could tough. do anything, it would look like a Wrangler. It would be powered by probably uh, a Voodoo, and it would have a transmission out of a 
a, a GT3. So let's do Ford and let's do <laughs> Grand World. Who needs time to think? Yes. Well, the problem is <laughs> there's so, you know, every time I think of a car, there's another one that comes up and, you know, oh, I should have said that. And uh, I, I, I don't play these games very well. <laughs> <laughs> You mean fantasy so, I mean, is difficult? Okay, it's I not mean, a drinking game, so you're good. I mean, you know, one of the things is, yeah, I, I, I am an, you know, off-roading is this thing I like to do in my spare time. And I've had a Jeep and I have a Forerunner. And I've always seen the Bronco as kind of like the average of those two. In other words, you get the removable roof mm-hmm. and the open air experience and the doors that come off of the Jeep, but you get the independent front suspension and the nice road manners of the forerunner um and that's you know like kind of like a great in between now i i keep wanting to get a hold of a of a bronco that has badlands with the 33 inch tires to to do a flex test and it seems like mm. sasquatch is on everything mm. so i've never gotten to actually team. try out the one yeah. i think would be the best uh, um chris doesn't come well he lives in boston never mind scratch that no, but, but he put uh, on oversized tires too i yeah sure. i i like uh i like that that truck a lot um i uh i don't own one um you know the the uh, the, uh the paid off forerunner has a lot of appeal because it's paid off and so i can put money into mm-hmm into shocks and a rooftop tent or mm-hmm. solar panels or something like that because they don't have a car payment you know so mm-hmm. so a paid off car is always a good thing but it's not yeah. really playing but your game that's the problem fair enough i mean we're all playing in, in theoreticals in my you know nonsensical um, little world here you know i've 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 had uh, off-road pickups before but I think uh, the articulation I get out of the Forerunner with a shorter wheelbase and the ability to sleep inside uh, and and carry things uh, that are protected from the elements mm. uh, is is appealing. And then when I use all four seats, the rear seats are a little bit bigger than they are in the back of any of the compact trucks. You know, the Ranger, the Colorado, the T- Tacoma the rear seats are just a little smaller we don't than they are in the forerunner which is actually almost got leg crossing leg room back there we don't talk um, about the back seat of the Tacoma that is not a conversation piece on the show anymore <laughs> so so i mean but that's i don't know i'm i'm kind of skating away from your question that's okay that's okay <laughs> i'm just i'm just taking the cattle prod out with this one yeah but i mean i mean i like a lot of things about the rivian but I don't like quad motors. I'd rather have two. I'd rather have a, a mechanical diff lock. I'd rather that when I'm pushing on the throttle pedal that the motors are doing what I tell it to do rather than something that the algorithm is figuring out. And, uh, you know, so, but, but I mean, the fact that that's electric, the fact that it's, I, I think the gear tunnel is brilliant. Uh, I think the cab size is kind of right sized, you know, it's kind of, it's more like a ridge line in terms of the interior and rear seat space. Yep. It's not full size, but it's certainly not the the, the Tacoma. <laughs> it, it uses the space in a very yeah, and it's got the frunk and the, to to Mike's point, the power to be able to to go uh, you know to power your campsite off road. Um, you know, I like the idea of the Lightning. I still haven't really spent any time with one. That's going to happen in the next week or two. It's. Uh, but it's not quite the off-road suspension, I think, you know, that, that you know, I like, I'd like to see like a Raptor version of that. Oh, yeah. Mm. You know, with I that mean, kind of suspension, you know, and that kind of uh, um, travel. So uh, as we talked about before, I spent a week with a, with a Lightning and, and I think my actual only complaint about it was that it had the big wheels and it rode a little bouncy but the stipulation and caveats of this is that the roads in connecticut where i live are it turns out terrible because it's cold here half of the year um and big wheels with small sidewall doesn't make for the best road quality yeah. who knew um 
the Raptor suspension and wheel and tire package applied to a Lightning would be spectacular. Right. But I mean, the way that transverse motor is sitting there, they just can't do that. Right. It would have to be right. a different thing than what a Lightning is. But to Mike's earlier point, this is early days. These are the first generation yeah. products in yeah. many cases. And as time goes on, stuff like this will get solved and figured out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like 1905 for uh, for cars, but for we're at the point yeah. where we're just trying to get people to buy electric pickup trucks. Where you know, once we get past that point, then we can start specializing. It is exciting. We should Mike, we should wrap up the show. We should we should, but I want to I want to hear Mike's <laughs> Mike's uh, Mike's dream mashup before we wrap. Uh, what you, you think, know what? Mike? I'm I'm going to tell you that it's the one I've been waiting for the longest, and and um, I am. I, I have, I'm just going to say up front, I haven't taken an off-road yet, um, but I'm very much looking forward to Ranger Raptor. Uh, it's, to me, it's, it's, uh, it's a great size to the point that yeah. Dan and I were talking about earlier for, for a mid-sized truck trail, not a, not a full size, yep. um, to be able to you know, take advantage of, a, of an improved suspension, which is what I would assume without me going into too much detail. Um, so I, I, to me, I, I, that's of, of all the vehicles that I see us having to be Ranger Raptor. I think, uh, Bronco Raptor having driven Bronco Raptor and knowing it's such a moon buggy, um, is, uh, <laughs> is also very, very impressive. Yeah. As a, uh, as an extreme consumer of Australian four by four content, I have high expectations for the, for the Ranger. Yeah, the Baja 1000, the Baja 1000 of the, uh of the Ranger Raptor was super impressive. Yeah. Yeah. As, as Ford continues to do with the, uh, the surprise Baja successes. So on well, that the, note, the success isn't surprising. It's just that they ran the next generation truck and didn't really tell anybody that kind of stuff. But like, we... Seriously. I, I saw <laughs> the one, the one that was um, a couple generations ago of, of Raptor. That was the, the new Raptor under the old Raptor body. And Stand there and drool. So, yep. On that note, we've done a show. This is uh, yeah. We've we've really gone places on this. I'll, I'll wrap it up <laughs> real quick. Uh, you can rate and review uh, the show wherever you listen to podcasts. Most of you still on Apple Podcasts. You can like and subscribe on YouTube. You can follow Dan on Instagram at Suspension Tuna. If you want to find his Twitter, it it does exist. It's still, <laughs> it's still tied to you. <laughs> He's yeah, not on it's still there. Yeah, it's still there. Uh, Mike is just, yeah, Mike is at Mr. Levine everywhere. He, at he did a good job. Pickuptrucks.com. <laughs> no, not pickuptrucks.com anymore. Uh, uh, that was the first I heard of Mike, so I, I had to throw that uh, that that uh, that dip in yeah. there. Well, thanks for having um, us on. Definitely. Yeah, it's been great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks, guys. And that's it. We did a show. Let me hit stop. This is the show. Yeah.